Greetings fellow pipe smokers. Eric Weaver here from Sea Smoke Pipes and Pottery. I thought I would uh, do a video today about some estate pipes that I recently picked up and maybe read a article from Pipes and Tobacco magazine from spring of 2007. So this is going to be a little bit of a longer video. Um, do any of you recognize this pipe or the pipe maker? Give you a good look here. So this is uh, one of the estate pipes that I recently picked up on eBay in a lot that had a buy it now price with a make offer option. So I'm going to tell you who this is. Here's another pipe by the same person. And I've already, I've already restored some of these so that's why they're all shined up. I gave them a good buffing. But these two pipes are Andrew Marks pipes. Now if you don't know who that is, he is an uh, American pipe carver. I believe he recently retired last year maybe. Or at least that's what I heard. I'm not sure if he's making any pipes anymore or not. Um, but there's a really good article on him that I'm going to read to you from Pipes and Tobacco Magazine, Spring 2007. So we'll get to that in a minute. But all I'm saying is it pays to do your homework. That means these magazines, in my opinion, are one of the best sources of information on collectible pipes. Um, it spanned from 1996 to 2018, I think, is when they stopped publish publishing it. So this lot of pipes did not say anywhere on the description or the title that it contained Andrew Mark's pipes. I only figured that out by looking at the pictures and zooming in, you know. When I, but when I saw the lot with the picture, this pipe in particular, I recognized that, you know, a little light bulb went off in my head. Andrew Marks. He has a very, his stems are very recognizable. He has a pretty organic look. It's an interesting treatment of his shank here. So anyway, that's why I bought this lot. So I got two Andrew Marks pipes. I got a a broken church warden, an old Wilkie from New York, but I should be able to fix that actually. I think I can still put a tenon on this existing stem. I also got a pretty nice, pretty fat bold Prince. This is also a Wilkie's pipe, pipe from, you know, the Wilkie's pipe shop in New York. So those four I'm planning on keeping for myself, or at least the Prince in those two marks. And then, of course, you got your usual kind of junkers that were thrown in there. We got an old Dr. Grubo, another Dr. Grubo, and these pipes. Actually, I don't even know if this is a Dr. Grubo. And a corn cob. Corn cob's in pretty good shape. I might keep that for myself. Fishing pipe. But these these ones, you know, these are. When you buy a lot of pipes, a lot of times there's some junkers thrown in, which is fine. <coughs> what I do is I just put those in a in a box, and you know, eventually the box gets more and more junker pipes, and then I sell all those as a lot to people that are into those. Because they can be worth, you know, they can provide good smokes too. It's I just, they're not really worth my time. Other people uh, can put a lot of time into those and rejuvenate them. Have a little afternoon coffee here. So this is my second smoke of this pipe. When I first got it, I quickly sanitized the mouthpiece and 
and uh, ran a bowl through it just to test it out. But this, this is the first smoke after I have gave it a more thorough cleaning and uh, buffed it up and put a little carnauba wax on it. Smoking some cowboy coffee from the Country Squire. It's a Virginia dark fired Kentucky blend. It's a very very cocoa type taste. Pretty good. I was smoking this last night too. All right. Hate to put that pipe down, but it's hard for me to talk with it in my mouth. So. Let's uh, read this article from 2007 about Andrew Marks. And if you're interested in knowing more about Andrew Marks, he did a really good two-episode interview with Brian Levine on the Pipes, um, Pipes Magazine radio show a few years back. So if you search for that, it's definitely worth a listen. He's uh, it's Andrew Marks is a really well-spoken guy. And he's been making, he was making pipes since, like, I don't know, 1969 or something. So he's kind of in the uh, older guard of American pipe makers. Very uh, unique style, very individual style. I've always been curious about his pipes, and now I finally own a couple. So <clears throat> this article is entitled For the Love of Briar, and it was written by Bruce Harris. Try to get comfortable here. So fire up a bowl and relax for a few minutes, huh? Andrew Marks worked hard at educating himself in the art form of briar carving. In Cornwall, Vermont, an old converted two-story chicken coop sits nestled among the sugar maple trees. The area surrounding this cozy 12-foot by 16-foot wooden structure is dotted with red barns, cows, and tall silos. The setting is picturesque. It is here in this tranquil community that world-class pipes are being created. I am a maker of handmade briar pipes, Andrew Marks wrote in 1969, introducing himself in the pipe smokers ephemeris to the pipe smoking community. With the exception of a short three-year hiatus, he has been at it ever since. Growing up in New York City, Marx knew at an early age that one day he would be creating something of beauty with his hands. Artistic ability is in his blood. He is the son of two very talented parents. His mother was an artist, painter, sculptor, and a prolific writer. She authored a number of widely read children's books, as well as instructional books on sand and wax sculpting, among other things. In fact, Marx often read his mother's books to his own children at bedtime and during the long, cold Vermont winters. Mark's father, also an artist, created and installed architectural metals that adorn the facades of many New York City skyscrapers. He did great work with bronze, Mark fondly recalls. Like many, like many of his men of his day, Mark's father was a pipe smoker. He smoked a great old straight-stemmed Dunhill shell, a pipe that Marx owns to this day. The craginess of the shell, of the shell finish, has become somewhat worn and smoother after years of loving use, but the pipe still provides a great smoke. When Marx was 15, his father presented him with a gift, a Dunhill all his own. Marx fondly recalls his father's advice at the time. If I was to smoke, it would be with a good pipe and at home. A few years later, the good-natured Marx lent the pipe to his college roommate. Showing complete disregard for the rarity of this special Dunhill, his roommate returned the pipe with a broken shank. As expected, Marx wasn't thrilled, but a silver band repaired the pipe, and remarkably, Marx continues to be friends with his old roommate. The two Dunhills, a few a few Cheritons and a, cu a couple of his own pipes and some miscellaneous pieces comprise Marx's modest personal collection. At age 26, while smoking his own little Dunhill, Marx thought to himself, 
I will make pipes by hand for my profession, ones that smoke well as well as that smoke as well as the old Dunhills, but with original designs, one of a kind pipes possessing their own individuality, beauty, grace, and elegance. This was the beginning of a, of his life's calling. Marx knew what a good pipe felt, looked, and smoked like, but he did not know about the intricacies involved with actually making pipes. To this end, he set upon learning the craft. He pursued every pipe maker and pipe repair man he could find. He found only a handful of pipe makers from his own generation. Thus, in 1969, Marx sought out what he called the old guard, master craftsmen, <clears throat> many of, them, of whom were already well in their 80s and sadly mostly forgotten today. Names like Joe Cord Cordigiano, who made pipes for Barclay Rex and the Wilkie sisters in their New York City shop. California's Mark Zeven, a very talented pipe maker, worked with Rosewood rather than Briar. Other pipe makers who gave their time and support were Jack Weinberger, J.H.W. Pipes, Max Schulte, Joe Strano, Bill Craig, Joe, Joe Gregorio, and Dick Johnson, who began making pipes in 1939 for the Weber Pipe Company prior to making kite pipes under his own name, R.C. Johnson, and running his own tobacco shop. <coughs> Excuse me. Marx traveled to Canada to meet octogenarian Giuseppe Condina, who was the last of the three Gen X, three generations of pipe making experience. Cardina was so skilled, so comfortable, and steady around the bandsaw, he turned it on and proceeded to trim his fingernails. It was a feat that Marx has never forgotten, nor one that he intends to ever try himself. Marx, the student, also made pilgrimages to the Arlington Briar Pipe Factory in Lower Manhattan, where he studied the old gentlemen at their wheels sanding and buffing factory pipes. Each workman, with decades of experience at his particularly particular speciality, it was there that I was first permitted to hand pick through their best briar. The dusty plateau blocks with their irregular shapes, individual character, and exuberant grain recalls Marx. <clears throat> For the next five years, Marx created pipes and learned and learned through trial and error. You learn a lot from failure, says Marx, even today, with years of skill and experience behind him. Marx continues to learn new tricks. Just look in that, that barrel, he instructs me, breaking it out in a hearty and contagious laugh. It's filled with my mistakes. You might want to call it nobody's perfect. In fact, the four-foot high barrel is filled with discarded pipes in all shapes, sizes, and degrees of completion. These will never see the light of day. Some are the result of Marx's own error, while others are attributed to failures of the briar. Either way, it can be, very fr a be a very frustrating experience for a pipe maker to disregard a potential pipe because of human error or flaw in the briar. Marx makes no bones about it. He became touchy when things... He becomes touchy when things don't go right, <clears throat> yet he is the consummate professional. Despite the overt frustration, Mark learns from the experience and moves on. Pipe making is a continual learning process, and Marx has become a better pipe maker over time because of these experiences. Take a look at some of these pipes. During the same time period, Marx realized that some of the world's finest pipes were being carved in Denmark. He knew that in order to take his pipe making to the next level, a visit to Denmark was imperative. Though the grace of a, through the grace of a fine gentleman, the late briar importer Per Herman, Marx visited Copenhagen. In 1974, and spent time with such luminaries as former 
Nielsen, then chief hand maker for the W. O. Larson, for W. O. Larson and Paul and Paul Hansen, a pipe maker of the highest caliber, and one whom Mark Fields is very underappreciated today. Hansen served as an apprentice to perhaps the greatest of them all, Sixton Everson. Everson made a lasting impression on young Marks. Sixton broke the myth of size, making exquisitely grained, designed, and executed small briars, said Marks. Two things about Sixton come to mind. One was his dignity of dress at his work, as he wore a necktie underneath his sweater. The other was his method of drilling. Sixton would drill the air hole not only while holding the briar in his hands, but after the pipe was entirely shaped and well sanded. Marks is a pipe maker who drills the air hole before all else. If the drilling isn't perfect, the briar block winds up and is nobody's perfect barrel of discards. Marks will not invest additional time or effort into a block, no matter how nice the grain is, if the air hole is not perfectly centered and drilled to his satisfaction. In other words, it must be perfect. Marks found Iverson, Everson's <clears throat> method of drilling the air hole, the air hole last quite unnerving. While in Copenhagen in 1974, Marx made two key purchases. One was a wood burning stove, which today warms his pipe studio throughout the harsh Vermont winters. The second was the purchase of a very large quantity of Corsican and Greek plateau briar from Herman. It was the same briar being used by Everson and the other Danish masters. And these two pipes that I got are from 1979. So I would assume this is, these are from that same uh, purchase. At an extra cost, Mark was permitted to sand down the sides of the block so as to examine the grain more closely. Today, Marks continues to make pipes from the original source of briar, which has been curing in his studio for more than 30 years. It is this briar, Marks, it is it is this briar, Mark's love for it and confidence in it, his ability to work with it, and his attention to detail that separate him and his pipes from others. I love the wood. The fun is in the briar, he enthusiastically explains. His love and fascination for his supply of briar is compelling. It is easy to see the passion and excitement that Marx possesses for the briar. I suspect there is no finer briar in the world today. It is, its beauty and smoking qualities are unequaled, he exclaims. To Marx, the briar is, is precious as well as being the single most important factor when it comes to making great smoking, a great smoking pipe. He is being modest. The briar may be a crucial factor, but in the unskilled or untrained hand, it will never be turned into an exquisite, sweet-smoking pipe. His inspiration comes from the classic English shapes and gr Great Danes. Marx has enormous respect for the classic billiard shape. Anyone can produce an unusual design, but having the ability to copy and recreate a classic billiard is no small accomplishment, according to Marx. His fascination with lines and forms and obtaining the proper graceful flow is evident in his attitude and his work. In order to make a good round, you must first make a good square, he explains. The Danes know this well. Their entire culture is geared towards fine, subtle, graceful design. The challenge is creating a functional pipe of everlasting beauty that is graceful and balanced. No easy task, especially considering that so many things can go wrong during the creation process. More often than not, the particular block of wood that Marx is working with will dictate the finished product. Veteran pipe smoker Martin Shapiro purchased his first Andrew Marx pipe in 1980 and now owns several Marx pipes. I smoke other brands as well, but Andrews can stand with any high grade. I believe, and this may sound strange, that that Andrew puts a great deal of love and passion into each pipe he makes. I know he uses very old top quality briar and has a wonderful eye for shape and form, along with the skills to make a pipe. 
that's mechanically perfect, but I truly believe it's what he puts of himself into each pipe that makes the difference. Shapiro feels a certain connection with Marks, which smokers often claim is a great added benefit of owning and smoking a pipe created a pipe created by a great artisan with whom you have a personal relationship. Marks, is, Marks produces only smooth finished pipes, although he occasionally, or although he personally likes a good sandblast, he does not make any sandblasted pipes. <coughs> Sandblasting is a good way to finish a pipe. It can hide imperfections and it lightens the weight of the pipe, explained Marx. But he is too enamored with the beauty of the briar and the grain to hide it. Without sandblasting or rustication, the briar can speak more, explains Marx. He uses extra virgin olive oil to finish a pipe and bring out the beauty of the wood. The inside bowls of, Mike's, of Mark's pipes are left untreated so that the smoker can see exactly what the natural briar reveals. A perfectionist, Mark leaves no aspect of the pipe's perfectly engineered construction ignored. Mark's hand shapes his stems, and he spends a good deal of time creating a double rounded bit that is wide and thin to the bite, thus ensuring a comfortable natural feel in the mouth. The stem to shank fit is uncanny. Lighting up an Andrew Mark's pipe for the first time is a unique, wonderful experience. The pipe is perfectly balanced, the engineering is sound, the briar, oh, the briar. He uses no bowl coatings, no special oil curing, just wonderful old aged briar. The pipes smoke smooth, sweet, and delicious from the first bowl. No break in period is required. Mark's pipes smoke like mellow, broken, and briar friends from the initial smoke. It's truly an amazing experience. Well, experience. Be warned after one encounter with an Andrew Mark's pipes, the discerning smoker will find it difficult to resist seeking out additional Andrew Marks pipes. They are that good. All Andrew Marks pipes are made entirely by hand in his Vermont studio. He runs a one-man operation. Occasionally a silver or gold band adorns an Andrew Marks pipe, but never will you find fancy woods or inserts. He does not use a lathe. The briar is literally in Marks's hands from start to finish. After drilling the air hole, Mark cuts the basic shape on his bandsaw. All shaping is done on his sanding wheel. Since, <coughs> since he began making pipes, all Andrew Marks are signed Marks and dated with the year. In 1973, he began placing a eighth inch briar spot onto the stem. The spot is from the same briar block used to make the pipe. I call it a briar spot to distinguish it from Dunhill's white dot, jokes Marks. None of the pipes are graded or contain extraneous nomenclature. I don't see them in terms of grade, comments Marks. From the mo for the most part, pricing is based on the briar. Imperfections, which Marks never covers up, will keep the price towards his lower end. Tightness of briar and consistency of grain will impact the price. Briar lives a hard life, Marks says. It's a rare thing of beauty with imperfections when imperfections are not present. Still, all Andrew Marks pipes are made from the same original source of briar he acquired in Copenhagen in 1974. No matter the price, all Marks pipes smoke wonderfully from the first bowl and continue to provide exceptional smoking enjoyment in the years and decades to follow. His work continues to evolve. For the past 15 years, Marks has been exploring other artistic expressions for his briar. His deep respect for the Native American Zuni tribe, found primarily in New Mexico, has resulted in Marks creating a number of original briar animal carvings, some of which have been made into beautiful functional pipes. The Zuni people have a special connection to nature. They believe all things have a spirit and that the spiritual nature of animals endows them with great power. Never satisfied with the status quo, Marx is also working on two new pipe shapes that were popular back in the 1940s and 50s but are no longer seen today. He has a glean in his eye, but he refused to spill the beans. <coughs> Excuse me. 
A man of many talents, Marx is also an accomplished musician who plays the drums and the guitar and writes songs and sings. Between 1987 and 1990, Marx took a brief sabbatical from pipe making. He spent time trout fishing and writing. He is the author of a fascinating book, The Rabbi and the Poet, Victor Reichert and Robert Frost, published in 1994 by Andover Green Book Publishers. A longtime member of the Pipe Smokers Hall of Fame, Marx defines the term artisan. After more than three decades of pipe making, he is at the top of his game. Marx is comfortable away from the limelight where he produces only about 50 to 100 pipes a year. During the late 1970s and into the 1980s, Andrew Marks pipes could be found and purchased at Paul Stewart's Men's Shop and Nat Sherman's Tobacco Shop in New York City, as well as er Ehrlich's Tobacco in Boston. That is no longer the case. Marks does not travel to pipe shows and pre-smoked pieces are seldom available on the estate market. Because of their exceptional smoking qualities, owners of these precious pieces of briar tend to hold on to them for long periods of time. Marks pipes come with a handsome handmade bag and are available in a wide range of prices and shapes. The pipes can be ordered directly from Andrew Marks via his website, which at this time was www.pipe.com. Now, if you look, just Google Andrew Marks Pipe Maker and uh, his website will come up, although I don't think he's making or selling any pipes anymore. Marx is happy to make a pipe based on a customer's specifications and loves to chat about pipes. He enjoys the relationship he has with his customers. Marx continually makes individual one-of-a-kind special order pipes at all price levels. And as he is, has been doing for over three decades, he invites interested smokers and collectors to visit him in his pipe studio in rural Vermont. A reservation is required and can be made via phone call or through email. All right, and that is the article from spring of 2007. And I remember getting that issue in the mail and reading that article and being pretty impressed with his work. Um, very different, unique style. And so far, the pipe's smoking great. So I'm happy. I got a good deal on them. And uh, yeah, you know, it uh, it pays to educate yourself as much as you can. If you can find any of these old magazines or any pipe books, read as much as you can. The more you know, you know, the better you will be at uh, spotting those hidden gems. All right, well, I'm going to finish this coffee and my pipe and uh, probably get outside. So you guys take care, and I'll catch you later. Thanks a lot for watching. Bye now.